we will start right into it. So without further talking, let's go into it. I um on the zoom session and i welcome everyone here and i have give the word now to johnny it's a pleasure <laughs> all right let's master okay so basically we're going to have to rush start but this is a piano concerto that dirt wrote based on two things by freddie Mer mercury from queen uh one song is called the kiss and the other one is man-made paradise i had never heard of those songs before and uh, i don't think most people have and but until the other day when i uh, look them up and listen to them and he uses them quite well if if Dirk if you want to say anything about these themes or why you use them or why you chose Freddie Mercury to make this uh, concerto with all right I, I keep this brief so first of all so thanks everybody for taking the time listening to my piece that doesn't happen every day especially with experts who actually know something about composing so I I really honestly appreciate that and I encourage everybody also giving me okay. critical feedback where things could be done better so that that would be of particular value so um, as a side note so this week i received a very well-meaning advice from i think a university professor who basically just told me to give up composing so there's that um so um hopefully this session here will be a little bit more constructive and helpful so so we we'll see how that goes um so i i like freddie mercury a lot i think he's perhaps an underrated composer from a classical perspective. I think a lot of his themes, especially the earlier music, um, could with a different language, so to speak, if he had used orchestras, classical instruments, easily be turned into um, high valuable classical compositions. He just never did it. Um, but if you strip everything away, the production, the performance, the prancing on stage and everything, and, and go to the very core of it, I think there's a a lot of musical um, value and, and strength and content in his composition. So that being aside, I did not write this concert as a Queen concerto, concerto trying to sort of like getting more views of people because the Freddie Mercury name is included. So I just started two years, 2019, with basically orchestral composing and I had this melody from Freddie in my mind and I used it as an exercise. I wanted to see how far it goes. and and. This is a very melancholic theme that is kind of a sad melancholic theme, but it has a counter, a little counter theme in there. And Freddie had this little 30 second segment in the song really that I essentially used as inspiration, but I, I developed it and I developed it further and became bigger and bigger. And at some point I also felt I wanted to have sort of the equivalent of a second movement <clears throat> and sort of the romantic section. And I kind of sang it in my head what the melody would sound like. And then I realized, wait a minute, that's essentially the slow-mo version of, of like a three bar from Man Made Paradise, which is a disco song of all matters. It's not a, not a romantic song. So I picked those three bars and turned them into this lush romantic sort of one minute, two minute interlude, so to speak, second movement and, and went from there. So that, that's basically all there is. I, I like to see this more as an inspiration than, than like a fan fiction or something. And I took those melodies as inspiration, but I tried to make it my own. So uh, if I may comment real quick, um, it's nice to meet you, Dirk. Thank you. Uh, and I, I identify with what you're saying um, about how you, you find a melody and you and you see the potential in it. You know, when I was creating my own album, I, I saw melodies too that seemed like there was just something there that could be explored. And I think that um, what you shouldn't lose sight of as a composer is that melodies in themselves um, can be inherently beautiful. And uh, it, it all depends on the medium in which they're presented. And so uh, I look forward to listening to this as a... Um, as a representation of, of you know the the taking out or the 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 using um, the kind of like in the ingrained uh, beauty of a melody and trying to explore that and see where you can go with it. So I'm very excited. Okay, uh, let's get started with this. Uh, we have it's one full movie. Got it into three different sections. So uh, we'll start at the beginning and stop about eight and a half minutes and then do a little discussion and. Do the second half. Let's get to, uh, get to this. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so uh, this was the first movement. So we have the discussion open. Oh, uh, okay. So is this really? Uh, it was just the first part. You could call it a movement, but I just I just cut it up in three parts. Um, exactly. Yeah. I'll I'll kind of be short of my time, uh, so that we could let everybody else get a, a say. This this uh this piano concerto is it's a piano concerto in genre, and um, in style. Uh, the orchestration is is definitely a piano concerto. The playing back and forth between piano and uh, orchestra is a piano concerto, but it doesn't seem to have the piano concerto form like the uh, uh, sonata form uh, with exposition, development, and recap. I don't know if the, maybe some people in the audience don't know what I'm talking about, but it seems to be like when I've heard this a few times, it reminded me of like a theme and variations on cadenzas. Like it's like a, a series of cadenzas. And uh, for you, those of you out there who don't know what a cadenza, it's like a, um, it's a, a solo section for the solo instrument to show off their techniques, kind of like a, a guitar solo in a rock song. That's kind of like what a cadenza is. And it, um, but it, they all use the same themes. The, the, the thematic development is still great, even though it's not in a strict concerto form. So that's all I want to say. And I want to pass it off to, let's start with Stuart because he's, this is his first one. Oh, thank you. I was here last week. Thank you very much. But um, <laughs> yes, um, no, I, I, I really enjoyed, um, yeah, like, like you say, the, um, the thematic development um, was really good. You know, you've, you've taken five notes basically and um, all of those and um, um, turned it, you know, done, done all sorts of different things with it and you've kind of gone kind of upwards with it. All of that and kind of the, the reverse of, of the, the descending motif. And I, I like that. That's really good thematic development. Um, I would agree um, structure wise. Um, it's not in sonata form. I, I don't think it has to be necessarily. Um, no, but but um, what I would say is um, there's a lot of kind of stopping and starting. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, writs to lento sections and then uh, it picks up some pace again and then it, it goes back into um, into a kind of final chord and then it, it picks up more pace and comes back again. And um, very often it's um, resolving back into F minor um, and it's, you know, so harmonically and um, in terms of the tempo, it's kind of always coming back to uh, to home, I guess. Um, and never really gets very far away from home. So even if you're not doing a sonata form where it's all about kind of going away from home and then finding your way back over the course of the, the structure, um, it would be nice to spend a bit more time away from home um, before cadencing back into, into F minor. Um, yeah, I think that's my, my general thoughts. I did have one very specific thing, um, which may open up a debate, and it's about how prescriptive to be in um, in your instructions. I noticed in bar 15, and this happened a few other times. Um, bar 15, you've got um, fortissimo in the wood uh, in the woodwinds. Uh, just it's just a chord. Um, fortissimo in the woodwinds, and the strings have a crescendo from I think it was MP to to FF. Um, so they've got different things going on, um, and that just yeah, personally, I'm very much on the side of just give the performers a very simple instruction, give them all the same thing, and then um, you know in rehearsals they'll work out the best way to to realise that. But I know there are a lot of composers who are very much the the opposite of that. So um, trust yes, me, it was a lot worse. Yeah. So there were so my my scores have a tendency to be over prescriptive, and okay. that's in part driven by feedback uh, so the, the audio playback <clears throat> using note performer mm -hmm. i want to make sure that that i get a, a reasonable feedback back and the computer as opposed to human doesn't really know how to play music so you have to be pretty prescriptive that being yeah. so with this score it's already tripped down a fair amount so it was a lot worse but you're i, I absolutely okay. agree and it's absolutely correct so it needs to yeah. be tripped out even further um yeah i mean 
if there's if there's a good reason for the strings to have a crescendo in that moment, um, and I I think it it does work um, it does work pretty well. I I'm just interested to hear what the other composers think about prescriptiveness in um, in particularly with dynamics, which I find I'm the exact I'm I'm the exact opposite. I put as the only reason I put anything on there is just because I feel like I'm required to. <laughs> I'll put a <laughs> piano or. A, for t- I, I mean, I'll put where it's soft and loud in some places. But other than that, I'm just like, yeah. you do whatever you want. Whatever you think sounds good, you play it like that. Yeah. But that would be yeah. my natural inclination. Yeah, no, that's my attitude yeah. too. But um, but yeah, some some people like, like, that. like that's one that's one of the hallmarks of the Romantic era. Uh, you know, the classical era, they just gave basic instructions. I don't think Bach even really gave a whole lot of uh, instructions on, on the dynamics and and. Um, whatever those uh, articulations and stuff, but in romantic, they went insane with that stuff. And it's like, okay, yeah, I get it. But like, it's, to me, it's like, it's too, too much. I, I rather focus on the notes and the, and let somebody else uh, interpret it. I mean, of course, if you have a big, huge ensemble, then you have to have some kind of direction or everybody's just going to play whatever the heck they want. And it's going to sound oh, like a nightmare. But it's what rehearsals are for, I think. But um... just, Maybe I've just sat through far too many extremely long rehearsals where they go through every single tiny detail. And I just think, well, what's the point of composers writing any in? <laughs> We're just going to... I mean, ironically, my experience as a performer, so I sang for several decades in choirs, and with any new piece, they usually spend like 10 minutes going through the score and putting meticulous articulations, dynamics in there that the composers didn't put in there. And that also kind of like sort of that shaped my approach, how to write scores. But I, I've received that feedback several times already, also with the mm-hmm. piano pieces, that it's over-prescriptive and sort of leave the performers some freedom there. And yeah. I'm getting okay. there. All right. Okay, so we have, uh, we have Dave and Amir. Is Amir here? Yes, I don't want to switch the screen and see who's all here. It's just Dave. I'm yeah. in. <laughs> Go ahead, Amir. Okay, okay. Amir. Uh, ahead, let, let me first of all, uh, thank you. Derek for sharing with us this beautiful piece. I was uh, looking for uh, some kind of sonata form as just Johnny mentioned, um, but to me it was somehow kind of uh, a perpetual uh, development of F minor arpeggio, uh, and it reminded me uh, quite much of uh, Beethoven's uh, Rondo Capriccio Opus uh, One Hundred Twenty Nine if I'm not mistaken. Do you know that piece? Yeah, so I don't think, but I think I'm pretty sure I know it. Yeah, yeah, I know that one. That's a, that's actually, what was that called? A, a lost, something Lost Penny? The Rage Over Lost my, Yeah, yes, 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 Rage Over Lost Penny. And, um, I'm quite agree with uh, that. Was my point. I, I actually wanted to uh, point it out that Stuart just had uh, just mentioned. Um, let me um, give it in, a, in an example. Um, grammatically speaking, it was like um, offering some words which are quite similar to each other or synonyms, and then uh, putting full stops one after one. Um, every each time it's like um for instance it's like being um water full of stop rain full of stop wet full of stop pool full of stop all the, the words which are related to the word water and then full of stop full of stop and these prolonged notes uh, they actually i mean it was uh, with such uh, motives which are quite uh, common in, in the standard repertory, like uh, Mozart's uh, Symphony Number no. 25. Uh, 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 which are uh, called Racket Mannheim and, uh, with, with, uh, with uh, an arpeggio, especially with minor scales. Uh, they can get to very, very, very exciting climaxes. And uh, I mean, I'm talking about the open phrasing. Uh, but it keeps stopping all the time. As, uh, as soon as the motor uh, is ignited, then stop, stop, stop all, uh, then and get all, all the time. 
but I really uh, enjoyed the orchestration and uh, the the development, the way you developed your that that motif. So may I give the pictures? I I completely understand it. That's also something I've heard from from others. Sort of this going, stopping, going, stopping. So the imagery that I had when I wrote this was kind of like the one line I put in that video description. People starting to date, to flirt with each other, and there's a lot of stopping and going off and going on in this imagery. So I wasn't driven by like a classical sonata form or some some recipe to follow, but the imagery that I had was this people getting to know each other and then maybe someone does a step, maybe too forceful, it gets rejected, pushes back, but then it starts again. And there's a lot of like starting, starting, but then overall there's a dynamic that gets stronger and stronger. And at some point there might even be a climax and they really fall in love and maybe even more. Um, so so that was kind of like the imagery I had to to have this stopping and going. But I, but I completely understand if, if if you don't have that image, then it feels maybe to interrupt. Dave, you want to say a couple of things? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you, Dirk, for sharing uh, for sharing that first portion. Um, I'm looking forward to listening to the rest, uh, but I, I do want to say a couple of things. Number one, um, vertical writing versus horizontal writing. Um, I, I, as I was looking at the piece, like visually, I saw a lot of you know chords that were you know, it was like huge vertical lines going down, whether it be, you know, in a, um, like a block chord in, or a rolled chord in the piano or whatever it was, you know, it was very, um, it was very vertical. And what I found myself looking for was um, a, a flowing melody uh, that, that did not just reference the main theme, but something separate that may have had some similar intervallic relationships, but uh, something that would kind of reference it, but you know, move the piece, um, move the piece to a different harmonic place. I agree with some of the others that we're talking about. How you know, it's got that um, tonality. It was F, right? F, F minor. F minor. Uh, yeah, um, I agree with some of, with these people who who kind of like, you know, I, I was waiting for um, something more than a, but like a. Like I would have loved to have uh, have seen a key change to like the relative major or you know to D flat or something where where you know you could like you can do um, some like a D flat chord and then A flat E F you know something something of that nature um, would have been nice. But uh, in regards to what you were talking about just now with the whole um, imagery thing, I want to caution you that. Um, while I, I do like the, you know, the idea of it, um, when you put it into practice, you have to make sure not to sacrifice, um, you know, the, the core musicality of, of the image. You know, if the image is the people meeting and falling in love with kind of like, you know, um, a hesitancy, there are, there are ways to interpret that less literally than, you know, the stopping and starting thing. Um, I mean, it can be, it can be, I mean, like, think about um, what comes to mind, like, um, uh, like a flute part uh, where I'm sure they're, they're in, in the classical repertoire, there exists, you know, hesitancy and awkwardness and, um, you know, un uncertainty in, in woodwinds, in, in brass. I mean, there are ways to express that musically, whether it be, you know, through, through a retardando, a slowing down, or through, you know, different melodic or, or rhythmic, um, you know, um, usages. But um, I think that that your interpretation, while I, while I really do like the idea um, of, of this kind of people falling in love, you know, I think that, that you're kind of in that place where you can either, where I think it should either be like completely there, or, or less, because I think you're kind of trying to, you're kind, you're kind of trying to like evoke that imagery uh, in a way that I think um, it might serve the music better if you had a little less of a, uh, if if you let go of the gas pedal a little bit. I hope I'm not rambling, but that those are my thoughts. I, overall, Thank though, I, I really did enjoy uh, what I listened to, and I'm looking forward to continuing listening.
Um, we had, uh, f to me personally, uh, figure C was a gorgeous figure of that of the of the of the uh, of the piece. I actually enjoyed the whole piece so far. What we hear, um, and we have someone in the audience who's uh, telling us that it seems that there are enough ideas for a lot more movements, and I agree to that because it would be interesting to hear more of how you develop the idea. Um, and he had the idea to maybe uh, copy uh, Rachmaninoff piano concerto to better understand how it de uh, developed thematic ideas, just for, just for an idea uh, came from the audience. Um, and um, something I really noticed was, uh, first of all, a very good sound. I, I personally liked it because um, you used um, Note Performer, as I found out correctly. Yeah, Correct, Note good. Performer, but also Piano Tech for the piano. Okay. And, and then there's some post-processing. So in the rigor, I used compressors, bit limiters, but also also 9, which is a mastering software that makes the sound. I, I tweak the sound a bit to make it cleaner, okay, less okay. Money, but also stronger. Okay, this is because to me, I think from all of the colleagues who are always in here, they can analyze your piece within every sound and note and everything. But I'm more the mixing engineer guy here. I listen to the sound, how what I hear, and I, I really liked it. Uh, the piano sounded great. Uh, the arrangement to me was very interesting to listen because I uh, didn't felt that something came twice in here. Of course, you have this. Uh, you have the motif, which is which is uh, going back at the end. Uh, but I didn't felt anything that I would say, okay, I hear this because it's repeating over and over. This is a very interesting thing. Uh, and I'm uh, looking forward to hear the next uh, movement here. Oh. Just go over here. <laughs> Okay, um, if, uh, if everyone would agree, I would like to start uh, to say something um, sure. on the piece. Now, I really enjoyed it. To me, it was very pleasing to listen. I actually would say I would pay uh, to, to, to hear this played by an orchestra. I actually see this piano concerto live. Um, it, sounded, it sounded gorgeous. Uh, something I noticed, um, I'm not sure if this is common practice, I'm not that much of a classical listener, but I felt that uh, figure G um, could have a little more low brass, or at least low, lower notes, to, to, have this, to have this body what lower brass can bring you. Uh, I felt it's, it's quite a bit um, that there's missing... A, body or something not that much but if you have uh, a tuba or actually maybe a bass trombone or something what could help here to make to make it a, sounding a bit more um more grounding would be my idea um and something i really noticed was on bar 280 and bar 400 and bar um a f a figure uh n was maybe you had these uh, pizzicato notes played by the by the strings, of course. Uh, I felt like maybe 
A soft colenio or uh, a Bartok pizzicato would help here to get more of a percussive sound here and support this this uh, dramatic hits what we heard because pizzicato sounded nice but I felt like it could be a bit more uh, aggressive here. Um, and I missed at bar 420 piccolo rips when we had all these on uh, all the way up. I I felt that a piccolo would would really support this 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 uh, this risers. Um, but this is um, this is just my personal preference. What I heard uh, when I listened to it that I that I missed this instrument. Um, but all in all, I really really liked. I really enjoyed it. It was very pleasing to listen. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple notes. Uh, uh, well, starting at uh, fourteen, I would first want to say like it's kind of it's not really a slow movement, but it's kind of like a slow movement when you come in with that second thing. You finish up with that uh, about fourteen, almost close to fifteen, and then you uh, you go from parallel minor to major. You make that minor to major and then you play that that thing right there is like uh my slow movements aren't usually my favorite parts of like big works but that i love i think that's my favorite part of the whole thing even because i usually like the faster more upbeat more chaotic stuff which this piece has plenty of it but i think that that uh that part is just gorgeous i think that melody is really really nice and it's, it's as cute strange. as i could get it it's what it's as kitschy as I could get it, as romantic and kitschy. That was my yeah, yeah, yeah. lush. Oh, it's kind of, it's kind of like the, kind of like the same feel as the uh, Romeo and Juliet by Tchaikovsky, you know, with the the warm strings. Uh, uh, but it's not. It's it's so strange to see that towards the end of a work. You know, you have like fast and crazy uh, development of the thing. Which, by the way, how hard is this piano? concerto to play on a piano with those trills um, like almost impossible nearly <laughs> as a pianist i can say um doing those pentatonic runs up and down at the tempo at tempo is going to be challenging though and the uh, trills the trill of the you know that all over it maybe like a couple times uh you back to back you can that might be doing but playing that Ooh, that would be a, that's the, you're looking like nine plus out of ten on something like that, for me at least, especially yeah, with my I broken agree. game. But very difficult. But I th I think that star of the show is that it it, it kind of reminds me of the um of the Romeo and Juliet, you know, with the the you know the you have the fast chaotic theme, and then you have the famous melody that comes in with the strings. Um, that's kind of what that reminded me of. I also wanted to say one more thing, and I'll pass it on to Stuart, is that I noticed you have cannons in there. You have, like, cannons in four. There's one part I marked, and I know it happened a couple of times. 1736, if anybody wants to go back, a cannon is where you uh, play exactly the same melody in different instruments or different voices at, the, at consecutively. Like, one starts it there, and then they play the exact same thing, and then they play the exact same thing, and they stack on top of each other. <clears throat> and it has to be contrapuntally perfect. I just noticed you, you, I think you had it in five or six voices, which is crazy to me. But they're, they're short, but they're, they're there. So that's a, that right there is a, uh, just on the compositional side, the, uh, the contrapuntal side, that right there is a feat to me. I'll pass it on to uh, Stuart. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I love the canons as well. That's another brilliant example of um, the um, Motivic development. Um, all the way through. Um, yes, uh, I just wanted to pick up on the point I made on the opening section about all of the stoppy startiness. Um, it did, it does get a lot better in the in the middle section. Um, there's there's still a little bit of that going on, um, and I now understand, obviously, with the the imagery um, in mind, uh, why that is. Um, but I I think yeah, so a lot of that improves in the middle section in terms of the tempo, uh, the harmony. It's still, it, it seems like, you know, there's, there's one chord for about, you know, 10 bars or so. Um, and it's it's a lot of really good kind of interesting developments within that chord. Um, but I'd, I'd love to hear, um, you know, movements to, to different chords. Um, yeah, it reminds me a lot of uh, um, a Beethoven sonata number 10. Um, well, the, the tune is, um, so it's, it's 
a very similar motif. Um, and you know, Beethoven I remember that, repeats that like twice, and um, and then moves it up um, by a tone, and then you know, does it in sequences, and, and goes. I mean, Beethoven does his own thing harmonically. He's, he's brilliant, but <laughs> uh, yeah. So so I think more movement regarding the, the chords and the harmony. I think would be um, I would just make it feel like it's it's got more kind of direction and more movement. I think. Um, yes. What else? Oh, yes. Uh, just a very small technical thing um, about the trills. When you've got a long trill um, followed by a rest, I would always um, write down how that trill ends, whether it's like um, you know, just writing in the grace notes that -da 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 at the end of it, um, or, or some, some kind of target um, to end it on, just so that the performer knows what the last note should be. Uh, whether, you know, because without that, it could be you could end on the higher one or the lower one. It's not um, immediately clear. Okay. So, but that's good to know. I mean, I worked with an engraver. He's actually also a professional pianist and helped me to okay. to thin out the notes a little bit and make it more playable. So. Yeah. For, for the piano and, and other instruments, but mostly the piano. So all of the trills end at the same note that they start. So th throughout this piece, but maybe okay. it should have been clarified notation more clearly. That's possible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's maybe the kind of thing that you could put in performance notes at the start, but I think as a pianist, I would prefer to, to see where it's landing. Um, yes. My, my last kind of general thing is about the use of the piano in general. Um, I thought, yeah, there's a cadenza, a solo piano moment near the beginning. Um, I would love to have heard another one near the end. Obviously, it features very heavily. Um, I do like that it goes away for a bit and then has a dramatic re-entry. That's really nice. Um, I think um, a lot of people writing a piano concerto would think, oh, I must have the piano playing all the time. And, you know, I, I think the fact that you, you don't actually makes it a lot more effective when it does come back in. Um, but yeah, I'd love to have um, a, another solo towards the end. Um, and then this ending, I'm sure um, the ending will be picked up um, as well. I, I like it. It's, um, it's an intriguing way to, to end. It's a bit odd to not have the soloist um, playing the last notes of the, of, of the concerto, but I can see why you've done it. And I, I oh, think yeah, it's, I, I, I don't quite know how I feel about it. To be honest, but it's it's certainly intriguing. Um, I like it. Um, I like it. I like yeah. the ending. It kind of reminded me of the opening of um, Mendelssohn's uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. If anybody knows what that sounds like, but anyway, go ahead. Um, yeah, I think that's that's everything. I've scribbled some other notes and no, said them all. Good. Um, yeah, I, I loved it. Thank you so much again for um, for sharing it. It's really, really well written um lovely pianistic writing as well all the way through and um, great orchestration thank you very much okay amir or dave uh amir. let me thank you once again Dave. i'm quite fascinated by the well-written pianistic phrases they're quite pianistic and interesting to play um the title that you just uh the title imposes us uh, the, the idea of expecting uh, melodies, whereas uh, the melodic part does not enter sooner than the time that two, about two thirds of the uh, piece is being heard. And, um, you know, it's the whole piece on the whole, is it just much of a, a harmonic development and uh, it could be supported by uh, a contrapuntal melody uh, below it or upper or, or at the upper voice. And um, regarding the historic aesthetics, um, I could not figure out to um, which era can we uh, get, uh, relate this, this piece specifically. There are several patches from Impressionism era, late Romantic, Romantic, and um, on the whole, 
it was not uh, unified altogether. And um, my final point about the orchestration was about the timpani. And since, since timpani is uh, considered to be a very characteristic, char characteristic uh, instrument, um, I couldn't uh, notice it, uh, its usage more than uh, two or three times on the whole piece. Are you agree on that? Or have I have it? No, uh, it's used more often, but in the playback, it got a little bit of sup suppressed. I'm not sure why that is, because originally it was louder, so I'm not sure what it is. But if you look at the score, it's, it's, it's used quite a bit. That's why. Dave? Okay. Um, thanks, Amir. Uh, so I just want to make a couple of points. Uh, number one, you know, I, I did enjoy the piece in its entirety. What I want to mention is, you know, I heard a lot of half diminished, like a lot of half diminished chords, um, right? And, and after a while, it becomes, I don't want to say predictable, but I will say that it, it detracts from, um, it, it, it will make the audience think, in my opinion, that you're running out of ideas. If you keep going back to that, um, and what, what that, um, for those of you uh, who don't know what a half diminished is, it's, um, it's basically a full diminished chord. That's one, three, uh, f one flat three, flat five, right? Uh, and then um, s seven. And then you, you make the five uh, natural, right? Am, am, I, am I getting that right? Seven natural, right? Yeah, yeah that, that's the chord. Right. So um, I, I heard a lot of that and it just, I think it was a little bit too much. Um, another thing that I heard too much, it, because, you know, it doesn't really reflect the fact that you have a lot of ideas because you really do. And a lot of them you, you put in quite effectively. Um, but I, like others have said, I, I would have liked some more harmonic um, change. I did enjoy the major um the, the change to major and this kind of like pastoral section that was so welcome for me it was like that's what i was looking for um and i wish that that had happened earlier in the piece um that's one thing another thing is uh the fact excuse that excuse me dave sorry dave uh dick uh, did you happen to think about uh, golden ratio maybe you meant that that moment that uh, Dave is talking about. Um, I, I know what you're referring to. So my, I came entirely from the storytelling. So I had quite a bit of kind of like a movie in my head. So and maybe that didn't come across and that's quite possible where it really it starts with this flirting idea and then sort of finally kind of like what you said, so in major, minor, sort of straight chords, lush, romantic harmony sort of the second movement but a lot later than where you would expect the second movement but this is often how it happens when you get to know someone sometimes it can take weeks until you finally i don't know share the first kiss or something and then you finally both are in agreement that's sort of this romantic resolution that ultimately then ends up in this climax with pounding and and whatnot so yeah. quite almost x-rated um, imagery that then resolves at the end so but i get the point so sometimes you have to make sure you don't sacrifice the music too much with sort of the the visual of the movie that you have right i would um, like, really like to see the the because like i was saying that it's unusual for the like a such a slow uh, melodic a theme to come in at the, the very end of something really fast and wicked like that, just like uh, Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet, you could you could have uh, bounced them back and forth. But I see what you're saying, but with the whole idea that if they finally get it to it to the end, and then it becomes X-rated or whatever you say. Sorry, Dave, for interrupting you. Sorry, sorry. No problem. No problem. Uh, I just wanted to finish up here. Um, there were there were two things. Uh, one of the things that I I would have liked to see less of was the fact that um, when you end your cadence is frequently ended on like an F minor, you know, or, or an F unison, something chord in that tonality. And uh, I, I had to like, look, 
closely at the score to see if I was like getting that right. Because the problem with doing that too much is that once you restart, you have to kind of like start there and take them out again. And so if you, if you just go somewhere else, you don't have to come back, if that makes any sense. But one of the things that I did like was um, that trill section. I thought that that had a lot of forward movement and I wanted, I want, I thought it was well-written and I wanted it to keep going. The cool thing about trills when you kind of like um, volley them back and forth is that uh, it, it has a, a forward momentum because it, a trill by its nature is an unstable, you know, it's not like a note, it's a trill. That's what a trill is, right? It's two notes that, that, that vary, uh, that, that go back and forth. And so the, you know, the, the idea of that, um, it created a sense of excitement and it, and it propelled the piece forward. And I, uh, I, I did enjoy that. Overall, I, I really did, I like the piece. I think that you have, um, you have a very good compositional um, style. I think that uh, you should make sure that your that the the concept that you have in your mind doesn't um, that that you um, express it that you make sure that it's expressed to its most musical part uh, potential. You know, because like a concept is great, but you know it can't it can't alienate the audience, and um, it didn't alienate me uh, entirely. But I. I I want your piece to have success. So that's my advice. Thank you. I, I highly appreciate everybody's comments. Amir, one, one, one quick comment. So you made the statement that um, it's sort of stylistically not quite locked in a particular era. <clears throat> I, I wouldn't go that far to saying that's intentional, but it's sort of halfway intentional. So my goal is not to sort of reenact a long gone era because that's ultimately what it is. I mean, what are we talking about an era that's that's gone 100 years ago so what i'm looking forward is more like um playing music that's closer to the 21st century but not in contemporary classic quote unquote style but as in pop music like some of the chords that get used chord changes that get used rhythms that get used would not have been used probably i would say 100 years ago or 120 years ago, but nobody has a problem doing it these days. And pop music uses that very frequently. And that's called, kind of like more like my guiding line. What is a little catchy, a hook, like a pop hook, but turning it into something lesser trivial than a pop song, but something in a more orchestral, piano concerto like language. That's sort of like my my vision. And that's my first, this concert was my first step getting in that direction. Hopefully other ones will get closer to, to that idea. But my goal is not to, to reenact or re, recreate the impressionist era or the romantic era or the classic era, which is even longer, so. Okay. Well, maybe uh, I can suggest you could uh, take Bernstein's, uh, Bernstein, sorry. <laughs> uh, Bernstein's um, approach maybe uh, on that idea what do you say okay actually one one other final comment so johannes, uh, johannes mentioned it would be great if it were played by someone in fact a few days after i posted it <clears throat> um, a pianist from the netherlands contacted me and we already basically agreed about that so they will for one thing professionally record it um, in a studio, wow. but also perform it oh, um, sometime this summer. And I'm absolutely thrilled. So this is fantastic. That's probably the best that can happen as a sort of beginner composer. And I'm really looking forward to that. Obviously, if other um, pianists and or um, orchestras would pick that up, that would be spectacular. So, Are you having uh, it recorded or playing live and recorded or just recorded on audio? Or what are you, what are you doing? So it's actually two step. The, it will be recorded in a studio professionally. So in a studio with the goal of having a proper audio recording, but there will also be cameras running and ultimately will be video cut from that. But once that's done, basically either the same day or the next day, they will perform it on stage. Basically one additional run through. Wow. Nice. Congratulations. So glad to hear that. Wow. <laughs> Very good for you. <laughs> Congratulations Thank on you. that. You know, because something that big with an orchestra and a pianist to play something that, that would, fantastic. would cost thousands of that would cost like twenty thousand dollars if you pay somebody 
to right. uh, it really would it would cost so much money that like it wouldn't even be feasible to think about it note performer would be the best option if you don't have that you know it's slightly cheaper yeah cool well that's good to hear and he's going Thank to memorize you. it oh <laughs> that's even better <laughs> so it's 26 pages of scores, yeah. Crazy. well yeah, good luck with that. I, I'm sure he's great. I'm sure he's, he'll be able to do it. That's a very complicated piece, so especially on the piano part. Well, uh, yeah, keep us updated. Uh, you said the summertime. Yes, time make sure to will, inform us for the performance. Will, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. can't wait to see that. That's amazing. So may I ask one last question? So sure. this, that's that's not about my piece or about me. It's more philosophy. So, so I, I think I mentioned it at the entrance sort of half jokingly so someone basically just smacked me and sort of dismissed it sort of like well just give up uh, composing but really the gist of that was i was actually going to ask you that why did here why did your professor tell you to quit composing? it was not my professor it was someone on reddit mm -hmm. actually i don't know who it is um it doesn't mm -hmm. matter and actually he wrote a lot more and there are some valid points in there and they were similar to what i've heard today so i appreciate that so but the key point was why even bother writing for an archaic era and that's verbatim. So what is your perspective on that? So as I tried to mention before, so my philosophy is not reenacting an old era and replaying it, but tr basically continuing where the old like 1910, 1920-ish, where it basically stopped. Here's my philosophy. Um, There's, a, okay, a lot of eras, like when you have Baroque and you have the Romantic and Classic, I mean, they all have their, their tropes. A trope is like a cliche where you write something and it sounds just like Mozart or just like Schubert or just like Mahler or just like Bach or just like, if, if you can write in the styles of those eras and try to avoid overuse of those tropes, uh, just the way they end cadences or the, the, the way they do trills, like Bach does trills differently from Beethoven does. And, you know, if you can avoid those tropes and make something original using that like if I, my particular favorite is just the romantic era. I mean, if you put Beethoven in the romantic era, that is my favorite era over classical and Baroque or 20th century. Mm -hmm. So if you can write using that styles, cause you know, you can tell what's different between Brahms and Mozart. They're very stylistically different. If you can, if you can write in those styles, Without sounding too, without using too much cliche or too much trope, for me, I think that's a huge bonus because that's the hardest thing about doing that is just not using those cliches, making it sound like it, but not making it sound, you know, that's too like Haydn and Mozart. Most people couldn't even tell the difference between Haydn and Mozart really just by listening to their music, but they could listen to uh, uh, Tchaikovsky and Mozart and tell the difference like right away, even the average person. So I think that with, with Haydn and Mozart, because they use a lot of the same tropes, they both sound classical, but yeah, there's really, it's hard to distinguish between the truth. So that, that's my philosophy on it. Mm. But the catches, but, nobody's going to play it. The academics dismiss it as prestige and orchestras just play pieces from long dead composers. Yeah. So that, that's um, a bizarre situation. Why, why, would, why would somebody play your piece if it sounds like Mozart, if they can get it from Mozart and chances are it's going to sound better because Mozart wrote it anyway. So, I mean, why? What, what would be the point? Well, uh, if I may, um, I have a thought. You know, it's uh, it's about honoring these people. It's, um, you know, it's about letting their legacy live on and uh, inspiring a new generation of musicians to, to study things that people have long forgotten. I mean, you know, it sounds cliche, and pithy and, you know, kind of like whatever, but, but when you're, when you're saying Dirk about like, why should you, why should you try and call back to, like you said, an archaic era? You know, the fact is that when these people were writing these things that we now consider archaic, they were new. You know, they were something no one's ever written before. They were, um, you know, like they were something interesting back then. And uh, there must have been something to recommend them to those earlier generations if they'd lasted long enough for you to, for you currently today to want to kind of like echo that, that form. Um, it's funny because uh, it reminds me um, very, very briefly 
uh, that, you know, like I, something I've always like um, in my work in the, in the Jewish uh, synagogue world, you know, there's always this kind of like this philosophy that, you know, you have the, the things that people, the music that people find like, um, you know, old and tired and, and like done to death or whatever, you know, at one point it was revolutionary, you know, it really was. And uh, it was, it was, and something, something made it worth keeping. So I think that, that if you channel that and you, you consider it as a way of, um, as a way of showing honor to what in this era was worthy of, of, you know, of bringing back, then that's enough of a reason. That's a good point. Yeah. Honor, um, honoring your, honoring your, the great dead composers. It's true. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, um, neoclassicism was very popular around a hundred yards, a uh, hundred yards, hundred years ago. Um, oh, and um, yeah, I, I love, neoclassicism it's it takes a style that then was what 150 years old or so um and puts twists on it and, and a lot of it is kind of humorous twists and i think that's why it appeals to me because I, I love humor in music um you know having um something that sounds like mozart and then doing some silly um you know chromatic chord in there just completely out of context that kind of thing um i think that's hilarious uh, but I'm I have a strange sense of humour, um, but yeah, I think if you can call back to the past and put a, a, a modern spin on it, I think it's it's absolutely relevant. You know, no one was saying neoclassicism is boring because it's classical, because the point is it wasn't classical. It was classical with a twist. So it was it was very new. So um, I, I I would say it is a little bit yeah. It, it can be a bit unappealing if you are pastiching a, a style directly um, from the past um, but if you have your own kind of personal twist on it or, or whatever you want to call it um, or if you fuse it with other genres um, community uh, a composers fusion network um, <laughs> shout out to our, our group um, you know that's um, <laughs> that's uh, yeah, that, I think that's the way to make it fresh and exciting and use music that people do love. People do love classical music, romantic it's music. It's funny you, you mentioned yeah. something that yeah. I have this even part of my, like the whole idea of, of combining pop and classical in a way to use classical writing um, techniques with and, but keeping it sounding pop and modern. I think that's the, that's the biggest way to expand music right now because not everybody is in the, I mean, most people aren't even in the classical, like most of the population don't even want to listen to classical. They hate it. But if you take the the good things about like development, theme, theme development, which almost doesn't even exist in pop music, it's almost non-existent. And you add those to them without making them sound like classical, then you can open up a new audience and a new market to ideas that they've never even thought of before, like motivic development, something you find in Beethoven all the time, but you never hear in like, the Beatles or Rolling Stone or any, you know, or any modern. So, so thanks for mentioning that, Stuart. <laughs> Take care. Thanks, everybody. So, all right. This was uh, the This Sunday CFN feedback session. I, w I would say it was a great piece of music, what we heard by Dirk. It was a very pleasing thing. I'm really hyped to hear the final recording uh, and to hear the final performance Maybe I consider flying over to the Netherlands and see this performing live because this is a very interesting piece of music. I actually said that within the live stream. So I'm actually, I need to go there and to see the performance of this track live. Um, it was it was an awesome one. It was kind of modern, but with, with, classical, uh, with classical writings. And this is something I like. Of course... We had something uh, like the the points what uh, Ambrist M said. It's um, some things could be developed, and some things, uh, especially orchestration or writing, could be could be uh, could be developed. But I would say all in all, it was a great piece to listen to, especially if it was not produced with some high quality DAW stuff, what we film composers normally use. Um, so it's a pleasing thing to listen to because if your audio quality or your production quality 
is not that high, you lose listeners because they listen to it and they are like, oh, hmm, that sound not really good. But um, to have this sounding, you have a beautiful piano, you have a great, uh, to me, it was a quite great string sound. Of course, some things like the dynamics or something are too... Uh, too loud because if you write for an for a PC or for a digital orchestra, you have to to take care of some things what are not the same what you would do with a real orchestra, and so far you have to be careful with that. Um, and but all in all, it was a great piece to listen. I look forward to 